Thank you very much. So uh, we just move on to the next speaker, and uh, the next one is uh, Lejek Gardewa. And um, we're going to stay in the Baltic with the next speaker. Lejek will direct our attention to uh, furnished burials in the Viking Age of Poland, <coughs> which traditionally are interpreted as Scandinavian, or rather misinterpreted. <coughs> And he maintains that instead a West Slavic interpretation must be considered. And he's going to tell us now why and uh, why he challenges these old views and what consequences the new ones are going to have. Pleasure. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, in my today's talk, I would like to take a new look at some of the most iconic Viking Age cemeteries discovered in Poland in the early 20th century. Um, for a long time in Polish and occasionally international scholarship, the people buried in these cemeteries were regarded as Scandinavian immigrants and as warriors who had arrived in the Pomeranian and Polish lands from places like Sweden, Denmark or Rus and who had served in the retinues of the first Piasts. Now, new research conducted by me and my colleagues, most notably by Kamil Krajkowski and Stisława Ratajczyk, has challenged this view, demonstrating that there's actually nothing Scandinavian about these graves, or diagnostically Scandinavian, and that they most likely belong to representatives of local West Slavic elites. So in my talk, I will briefly discuss the empirical uh, basis for these new ideas and the wider in implications this interpretive shift may have for the much broader and international field of, of Viking studies. I will begin with a map for those of you who are not familiar with, with Polish geography. So this map shows Poland within its current political borders. And the sites I will discuss are underlined in yellow and include places like Ciepłe in Pomerania, uh, Lubon in Greater Poland and Lutomiesk in Central Poland. I will begin with the northernmost site known as Ciepłe or in German Warmhof. This cemetery was discovered in the year 1900 during construction work and unfortunately it was rather poorly documented and then during the Second World War most of the finds uh, disappeared. All we have today from this initial excavations are those images. Um, from the start, one grave, which you can see um, in the slide, drew increased scholarly attention. You can see that the contents are, are very elaborate, extremely rich. It was an inhumation grave with a, with a lavishly decorated sword belonging to Jan Petersen's type Z, equally elaborate stirrups with silver and copper inlay, horse bits and other equipment. Since the moment of its discovery, Polish and international scholars have been really battling um, over the ethnic identity of the deceased individual. And some regarded this person as a West Slavic rider, Others, and in the majority, uh, considered this grave as that of a Scandinavian Viking. And until very recently, the view that this was the grave of a Scandinavian Viking dominated in Polish academic literature. But I think anyone who actually knows a thing or two about Viking Age art and Scandinavian art of the time um, will immediately notice that there's actually nothing ostensibly Nordic in the designs of these uh, weapons and, and riding equipment. Um, the second site is the cemetery at Lubon near Poznań, which was also discovered by accident by physical workers in 1937. And this site was also in the 1990s hailed by some Polish scholars as the resting place of Scandinavian warriors, who again, in the opinion of those scholars, had served uh, the Piasts, the Piast dynasty, as mercenaries. This view was predominantly based on the military equipment these people were buried with, and in particular, axes. So this T-shaped axe and this M-type uh, axe that you can see in the slide. We know very well today that T-shaped or long-bladed axes, as they are sometimes called, uh, are actually not Scandinavian uh, products and that they are quite characteristic for the West Slavic area, especially Greater Poland and Poabia. Uh, and they're actually extremely rare in Scandinavia, although they do occur in very interesting locations, for example, in Denmark and Sweden as you will see uh, later on. Uh, so actually, again, there is nothing ostensibly Scandinavian here, which does not stop some scholars to still uh, continue maintaining this, this, this narrative about Scandinavian mercenaries in, in Greater Poland. Now, the third case, which is very close to my heart, and uh, I'm totally fascinated by this site, 
is the cemetery at Lutomirsk in central Poland. Uh, the history of this site is, is quite uh, intriguing and dark occasionally. Uh, it was discovered in the year 1940 during the Nazi occupation of Poland. And from the start, German archaeologists desperately wanted this site to be a Viking cemetery. And despite their intensive efforts to find more proof for that, other than the sword that they found, uh, there was actually nothing that could uh, sustain this idea. So, completely upset with their excavations, they abandoned the dig. They only excavated about 15 graves and abandoned the excavation. After the war, uh, Polish archaeologists re-excavated the site under the leadership of Professor Konrad Jaszewski. Uh, Jaszewski wanted to prove this, the Germans wrong and to show that the site was actually uh, a Slavic place. And he even invited the famous Swedish archaeologist Holger Armand to come and see the excavation and to prove there's nothing Germanic about it. And indeed, Armand came in 1949 and he said that this is true, there is actually nothing Germanic here. Um, however, uh, in the same year, in 1949, the, the discoveries of two lavishly furnished graves labeled 5 and 10, and you can see them uh, in the center of the uh, cemetery, caused a bit of an interpretational puzzle. Uh, they contained riding gear, uh, which looked very exotic to the scholars of the time, and because no, there were no parallels uh, to those finds in Poland, uh, it was immediately suggested that the finds had originated from Eastern Europe from the Rus area, or even from farther away. Some people said that even as far away as the Urals, actually. Uh, and therefore, with this Eastern Rus link, a link with Scandinavia was, uh, was also created. You can see the contents of grave five in this slide, especially those really nice uh, strap distributors and other uh, riding gear and weaponry. And <clears throat> Excuse me, and here you can see the finds from grave 10, as well as a reconstruction of this grave. And this was an inhumation, uh, this was an inhumation uh, grave. Uh, both graves, as I mentioned, included uh, beautifully decorated bridles. Here in the reconstruction, you can see what they may have looked like uh, originally. In looking at the historiography of the Lutomirsk Cemetery, you can see that there has been a serious identity crisis for the Lutomirsk warriors. Based on the grave goods these people, uh, these people were laid to rest with, over the years they have been labeled as Scandinavian Vikings, as Rus, as Varangians, as Pechenegs, all kinds of different nomads, essentially anything but locals, anything but uh, Western Slavs, which is very interesting. Um, the wind of change began to <laughs> blow in, in the early 2000s, uh, when modern and meticulous re-excavations of the cemetery of Ciepua uh, were conducted by Zdzisława Ratajczyk, an archaeologist from the Archaeological Museum in Gdańsk. And these have provided extremely important data that has allowed us to cast new light on the material culture and identity of warrior elites on the southern coast of the Baltic. The site has not been fully published yet, but we are working on a, on a comprehensive publication of all the finds from, from this site. Uh, including specialist analysis of some of the equipment. Uh, particularly groundbreaking was the discovery of grave 42, uh, which contained high quality military equipment and an elaborate set of riding gear. What is most interesting is that on the feet of this deceased person, there was uh, a complete set of zoomorphic copper alloy spurs, identical to those found at uh, Lutomirsk in those two graves, five and 10. This is what the spurs look like after conservation. And this is the latest replica that I commissioned from a, from a Polish artist. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me today. It's rather difficult to travel with these kinds of, uh, kind of things, but I hope this image speaks to the imagination. Um, in a series of recent studies, together with my colleagues, with Kamil Kajkowski and Zdzisław Ratajczyk, and also a Swedish uh, friend, Ben Bengt Sederberry, uh, we have argued that spurs of this type are of West Slavic design and that they convey important details about Slavic pagan worldviews. Essentially, we believe that the spur is a model of the Slavic cosmos. Unfortunately, I cannot go into detail here, but I'm happy to discuss this during the break, and I can also give you some of the literature we've published recently on this topic. 
Establishing the West Slavic origin of the Spurs and deciphering some of their meanings has helped us to identify some of the diagnostic material markers. Ben is an expert on that, um, of West Slavic uh, elites. We can now say with confidence that in, in Slavic artwork, um, the Western Slavs used ornaments referring to animals like snakes, horses, cattle, and birds. The snake, however, sometimes with additional wings, was probably one of the most important creatures for the Slavs, and perhaps served as a kind of emblem of a very particular group of people, a family, or a clan, maybe a, even a dynasty. Um, so what impact can all this have on the international field of Viking studies? I believe that this new work on West Slavic elite culture can substantially nuance our perception of cross-cultural interactions around the Baltic Sea and beyond. Uh, and we can now finally better identify West Slavic warriors using both archaeological methods based on material culture, and we can trace and see their mobility across a large geographical area. So here are just a few examples. Over the last uh, years, uh, metal detecting activities in Sweden and Denmark have brought to light a number of objects of exactly the same type as those from the area of Poland, especially from the area of the Piast state. The new investigations of West Slavic art, such as those that I've quickly summarized, um, are also helping us to reinterpret some of the old finds and demonstrate that they have been misinterpreted. Uh, by some uh, Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian, uh, Scandinavian scholars. Uh, this is just one example of new research. Together with my colleagues, uh, we have recently published an article about a new copper alloy goat of the Lutomirsk Chepwa type uh, that was recently discovered in uh, Skegria in Skåne in southern Sweden. And the presence of such a high status object, uh, something that to my mind must have traveled with its owner, its original owner, uh, close to Harald Bluetooth's fortress, has very interesting implications. And this suggests to us close interactions between West Slavic and Scandinavian elites in this area. This is something we have not had before. Um, of course, interactions are well known through the presence of pottery, certain types of objects, but this is something that's of extremely high status. Um, recent re-excavations of a well-known chamber grave at uh, Birka have also revealed a typically West Slavic T-shaped axe in an annex to this grave, suggesting perhaps that uh, there are some West Slavic links there, or that Western Slavs of very high status were buried at Birka, or at least that their material culture of this high status was, was buried there. Now, a new look at the well-known grave from Veltz, which you can see in the exhibition in Copenhagen, and a new look at the stirrups, uh, and comparing them with some of the finds from Poland leads to the, I think, unequivocal conclusion that their decoration refers to West Slavic pre-Christian ideas. Uh, you can see the two intertwined snakes on the stirrup and an analogous motif on a kaktorga, so an emblematic West Slavic object from Biskupin. And there are many, many more examples. Uh, other things in this grave and the decoration of other things in this grave also suggest that this actually is West Slavic and not Anglo-Saxon equipment, as some scholars have uh, previously thought. So to sum, sum this up, I will just show a few slides from the well-known um, fortress and cemetery at, uh, at Trelleborg. Already a decade ago, Danish archaeologist Anders Dobat argued for a strong presence of Slavic warriors, or strangers as he calls them, in the realm of Harald Bluetooth, and their burials have been identified uh, using also isotope analyses at, uh, at this fortress of Trelleborg and at several other sites. What I want to point out is actually that one of the richest graves in the cemetery, labeled as grave 128, uh, has a foreign isotopic signature and also contained this emblematic T-shaped axe. So this is a very interesting example of a correlation of isotopic signature, isotopic data, and artifactual data of a very high status emblematic uh, object. But what has so far been unnoticed, I think, is that it's not only the type of axe, it's not only the isotopes, but there's also the decor. Uh, and you can see that on one of the sides of this axe, there is a representation of a winged animal. Perhaps 
a bird, but perhaps a winged snake, analogous to some of those snakes that we see um, in, in West Slavic um, art that has recently been um, reinterpreted. All these uh, reinterpretations of West Slavic material culture and the warrior ideologies are also helping us to track down the mobility of West Slavic elites or their warriors outside of Poland, Germany, and Scandinavia. There's a growing group of uh, curious finds from places like England, such as this spur goat from Charnwood, uh, which again suggests the presence of high status um, elite riders or warriors uh, beyond this world of Scandinavia, Poland, and Germany. In, in the British Isles. In my view, and this is just very preliminary, also this sword guard from London, from Sherborne Lane, which is usually interpreted as an Anglo-Saxon uh, product, may have actually belonged to, uh, or been produced by uh, Western Slavs or in, in a Western Slavic workshop. You can notice the decor and the similarities of this decor to some of the finds uh, from Lutomiersk or Gietz and other places. So to sum up this quick, very quick overview of uh, latest work on West Slavic material culture and warrior identity shows the great and still untapped potential Central European archaeology can have for nuancing the picture of cross-cultural interactions in the Viking Age. And I think we certainly have to work more on strengthening and uh, expanding our research networks. And so I think we have to develop more collaborative and interdisciplinary projects together, and events like this are great to start this kind of collaboration. And we also have to find in ourselves the strength and courage to challenge previous vitrified misconceptions. <laughs> I'm trying to find that strength, although sometimes it's not so easy. Thank you so much for your attention.